cut people out of crashed vehicles. Tonight we're going to show how the enormous power of these things were used in a rescue, together with the skills of a trained paramedic. The story begins when Mark Hayes, who then worked in the building trade, was on his way home to his wife Sue and his three-week-old daughter Ashley. He was travelling as a passenger in a lorry on the M53 in Cheshire, when, just outside Chester, the lorry was involved in a terrible accident. Mark and I met when um, we were 16, and uh, we fell in love straight away, and um, we were see we seen each other for eight years, and then we got married. He was a happy, outgoing person. He was really fit and healthy, and um, he'd do anything for a laugh. He'd, he was really happy, go lucky fella, you know, and he, he enjoyed life. He really did enjoy life. I went down, had a look at it, and I thought to myself, oh my God, here we go. We've got a real bad one here. I looked at the man and I thought, my God, he's dead. We will never get him out of here. <laughs> Mark, you're gonna be okay, you're gonna be okay! I know, just that just right hang on. Just take it easy, Mark. Someone's gone for help, just take it easy. Paramedic Dave Owen and the ambulance man Andy Hartley were on standby six miles from the accident. Dave had recently qualified as Cheshire's first paramedic. This was to be a major test of his new skills. I was thinking, where is he? I was angry because I thought, you know, he's, he's staying out. He's not coming home. He's just gone for a drink and he's not going to come home tonight. Gone right through it. You're going to be okay. Someone's gone for an ambulance. <laughs> just take it easy. You're going to be okay. Yeah, here they are. Hurry up, mate. Hurry up. He's in a bad way here. The ambulance arrived within six minutes of the call, but Mark's condition was deteriorating fast. What's your name? Mark Hayes. He said, am I going to get out of here? Am I going to die? And to be perfectly honest, I thought, well, yes, you are, but uh, I obviously didn't say that to him. I was uh, expecting any minute that, that the man would just die in front of me. Am I going to die? No, no, you'd be okay. We'll get I you out of here. Andy, yep. can you get me some equipment? Can you get me the O2? It appeared from speaking to the, to the driver that he had lost control of the vehicle, gone across the hard shoulder and down the embankment, and that in his attempt to bring the vehicle back onto the motorway, he demolished something like 40 to 50 yards of motorway fencing, and two of the lengths that had come through the vehicle had actually impaled Mark. Hey, can you set me an IV line up with some helium cell, please? I'm gonna die. Oh, you're not dying, Mark. You're all right. We're getting out of this. Cheshire fire crews were on the scene soon after the ambulance. While Dave Owen stabilised Mark's condition, the fire and rescue team had to find a way of taking him out of the cab without injuring him further. Nick, can you sort the lighting out, please? Make sure we've got a hose reel and a battery sorted. That's all. Right. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> As the night progressed, I continually asked him much the same questions. Basically, we did that just to assess his level of consciousness. How long have you been married? Oh, Two years. Any kids? Any kids? I... Ashley. Ashley. How old are you? Two years. Three weeks old. Settle down to watch the telly. You're listening for every car that comes down the street. You know, is this him? No, it wasn't, wasn't him. The day of the accident, Ashley started screaming as soon as he went out the door. She did nothing but cry all day. She was really as if she knew that was her dad wasn't going to come back. Look, I think we're going to have a problem with getting him through these doors with the stakes in him and the ECG and things. Right. 
what we need to do is take the roof off and get him out that way. So we're going to take him out where the stream was, having cut the roof pillars and got the roof out of the way, yeah? Right. Obviously, you can kill somebody by just taking out of a vehicle. So um, we had to be very careful what we did with him being impaled through the seat as well, which made it doubly difficult, if you like, because we didn't just have the poles and mark, we had the seat and the cab, because everything it worked, the poles went through everything. So it was, it was quite a difficult task. Can I have another bandage, Andy, please? Thank you. Stay with us, man. Okay, Stay with man. us, mate. Do us relax. Keep nice and steady. He was convinced that he was going to die. And the questions and the comments that we were making to him and reassuring him went a, a long way to to alleviate this fear of impending doom that he had. How long have you been married, Mark? Years, yeah. OK, Mark, you're going to feel a sharp scratch in your arm. Just relax, keep nice and still for me. OK, all right. You're doing very well, Mark. Right. OK, Mark. What about this, mate? Must be the most expensive drift stand in the world. Rock steady, that's me. It is very distressing. You know, it is, for, from our point of view, when you get a lot of screaming. But one good thing about when, when people are making a noise, they've usually got the strength to make a noise. It's when they go really quiet. That's the worrying time, really. There were a few times where... He, he just stopped talking, stopped answering our questions. Um, when we mentioned his family, he, he just... You could feel the fight sort of rise in him, really. I was waiting and waiting and waiting. And I just knew that there was something wrong. It wasn't the usual, oh, I'll be late, you know, when he's staying behind. There was just something there. An hour after the crash, the pneumatic shears started to clear the way for the most difficult part of the rescue. going through the body had gone through the seat as well so we actually had to cut the seat away or part of the seat away to, to actually cut the pole that the pain was absolutely excruciating. I think uh, a lesser man, uh, probably myself, I would consider myself a lesser man than he, I don't think I could have stood the pain as well as he did. There was a knock on the door at about quarter to 11 and I went to go to the door thinking it was him to tell him off and it, it was the police and they'd said that there'd been a bad accident and that's when everything just went to pieces then. I think that the moment that we managed to lift him out, I think that was the, the most frightening part of the rescue. Everybody was quite concerned that the fact that this must be done very quickly and with the utmost care. But once he'd been placed on the stretcher uh, and he was still conscious, well, we thought we really have got a chance now. We've done our work. And then it was up to Mr. Kane and the, and the people at the hospital to, to do their work. An hour and a half after the accident, Mark was taken to the Countess of Chester Hospital, where a surgical team was standing by. The next few hours were to be crucial in his struggle for life. Mark's appearance when he first came in was horrific, really, because of these two massive 
pieces of timber impaled on his body. And I don't think I can recollect seeing somebody with such visibly horrendous injury at the time of admission. It then became apparent that he had a number of very severe internal injuries. Uh, he'd got a number of ruptured ribs. He'd ruptured his diaphragm, he damaged his lung, he damaged his spleen and his pancreas, uh, he damaged his small bowel, and he damaged his large bowel. Can we have a chest strain, please? Yeah. The surgical team said that his chances were less than sort of 5%. It, was, it wasn't sort of day to day or hour to hour, it was minute to minute at that time. Just chest and abdomen, no limb injuries. Once the, the casualty had gone, we just sat there and that was it for five minutes. We just shoo, gone completely, totally zapped all of us, you know. Um, and then to, to hear that he, he was still fighting and still living, it was, was a great boost to the, to the watch. It was really good, you know. I suppose the operation must have taken about six or seven hours in total because once we'd removed the pieces of timber, and that took probably half an hour with great care, uh, we then had to remove as much of the contaminated uh, material as possible, and there were lots of timber fragments in his abdomen. When I came round in the cab and I realised, I realised we'd crashed, obviously, uh, but I didn't know what the extent was, and I tried to get up and I couldn't move, but I could just see these two stakes sticking out of my stomach. I just went mad and I just screamed. And just the pain was so, it was so intense, it was, it was unreal. And then I, I went into like a shock because I couldn't feel anything then. And then I just started to get tired, wanted to go to sleep. I went into an out of body experience. And the next thing I can remember, I was walking across the field and I was walking away from the scene of the accident. And I was, I think I was going home to be honest with you. I was just thinking again about Sue and Ashley, how are they going to find out and who's going to mind Ashley while Sue goes to hospital and uh, I, was, I could see me on the seat of the wagon and I said, oh, is that me like? And then I turned around again and then the next thing I can remember, I was back in the cab and the fire brigade were trying to cut the wood. Mark made a remarkable recovery, considering the severe injuries. But in addition to all the serious injuries that we've described, Mark also had an injury to his scrotum. And we were concerned for some time afterwards that he wouldn't be able to father children. Mark's recovery went much further than the doctors ever imagined. Two and a half years after the accident, Mark and Sue surprised everyone. They had a second child, Michael. <laughs> When we found out she was pregnant and we were going to have another baby, it was, it was unreal. We were so overjoyed, you know. I'd, when she told me, I just cried like it was great. Mark said to me, would you like to be Michael's godfather? And I thought, well, yeah, certainly. I was, I was very pleased. And I, uh, I don't often get a tear on my cheek, but I think I was, uh, had a little weep then. I thought that was a... A touching moment. I was very pleased. I was very proud. It made Mark stay because he'd missed out on so much of Ashley. It made him feel whole again. It made him feel that, you know, that much better that he he had succeeded in something in life now, and he's got this little son to show for it. <laughs> <laughs> 